Today's episode was sponsored by Casey over on Patreon as a birthday present for her husband, Doug. Doug. So, uh, happy birthday, Doug, and let's go ahead and get this bad boy up on the wall, shall we? Yeah! So, uh, yeah, there it is. Um, I wish I could have gotten it closer to Casey's patch, but, um, that's not how quilts work, so. Which, yeah, Doug actually bought a patch for Casey way back when, and now Casey is returning the favor, and I just want to say that I very much support this behavior. And, like, obviously, I don't know what the future holds for Casey and Doug, but I have heard that polyamory is very big nowadays, so if you guys ever find yourself expanding your relationship and need to find your new partner or partners a gift, I hope you know who to turn to. That was a weird thing I just said. Pretend like I didn't say it. But seriously, happy birthday, Doug. Um, your birthday, as you, I'm sure, know, is not actually technically until June, but um, Casey was very smart in assuming that if she asked me to do something in in April, I would I wouldn't get it done until June. But for whatever reason, I worked fast this time, so it's a little bit early. So um, hopefully, I remember to wish you happy birthday again in June, and if not, just remember. Just remember that I'm saying it now. But yeah, happy birthday, and thank you guys for your support. And with that, let's start the episode, shall we? Hello, Knitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Nitkalis. And much to my own dismay, I got a copyright claim on the last video I made for this channel, so... That means that it's time for yet another episode of my massively tolerated series, Public Domain Happy Hour. This is where ragtime music would go, but I didn't feel like licensing it. La la. So for those of you who didn't watch the first one of these I made, which according to my stats is most of you, in this series... I basically just make videos about media that's in the public domain. The nature of the videos I make means that normally I have to use a lot of copyrighted materials, and the people who own said copyrighted materials do not seem particularly happy about it. And just in case any copyright lawyers out there are currently watching this, I will state for the record that every time I make a video, I am very consciously trying my best to adhere to fair use as I understand it. That said though, fair use is extremely complicated, and much to my mother's disappointment, I'm a YouTuber, not a lawyer, so no matter how hard I try to do everything right, there's still always a chance that I did something wrong, and if that happens, things could end very badly for me. Add on top of that the fact that I won't know if something went wrong until I've already spent a lot of time making the video, and the fact that if something does go wrong, there's not a lot of ways I can defend myself aside from a couple of forms I can fill out, and it all means that releasing a video can be very stressful for me. There is a non-zero chance that over the next couple of days, I will lose sleep waiting to hear back about the legality of my hour and a half long discussion of B-Movie, and I will be perfectly honest here, that is not really where I was hoping my life would be at this age. Whenever I release a video, I risk putting myself through a lot of stress that I simply do not need in my life. So this time around, I'm going to give myself a break and just not risk it. By talking about a movie in the public domain, I don't need to worry about the length of the clips that I use or who might get angry at me if I use them. I can just make the video I want. Hell, I could just show you the entire movie if I felt like it. I mean, I won't, 
because these public domain movies tend to be pretty boring when you watch them in full, but I could, and knowing that is very reassuring. And once I decided to make a video about a public domain movie, the question then became what public domain movie I should make my video about. And this time around, I kind of wanted to talk about a horror. After all, that's what I think of when I think of public domain movies, you know, the kind of schlocky, B-grade scare fests that get lost to time until someone like Elvira or Joe Bob Briggs digs them out of obscurity for a Sunday afternoon matinee. So I scanned my handy dandy list of public domain movies looking for something like that and found something that seemed perfect. It's called The Screaming Skull and it's absolutely bonkers. All right, so The Screaming Skull is a movie, and it is in the public domain. All right, so full disclosure, this section of the video is where I would normally give some context on what the movie is and why I'm talking about it today, but I don't really have much to say in that regard. There's no reason in particular why I'm doing it. I just picked it off a list of films in the public domain. And if there's some big interesting background information on it, then it has been lost to time because I certainly couldn't find anything. Truth told, I probably should have just skipped this section of the video altogether this time around because like, Let's be honest here, it's not like my videos really need to be padded out. That said though, something about that felt weird to me. All of my other movie videos have followed this format, so I kind of felt like this one should too, even though, again, there's absolutely no reason for it to. In my attempts to research this movie, I found two things that felt like they could kinda be worth mentioning in this part of the video, and fair warning, neither of them are particularly interesting. The first is that the film is notable for a weird marketing ploy it used to try and attract an audience, but since they mentioned that ploy in the movie itself, I'm actually going to wait until the plot section to discuss it, so it doesn't really do me a lot of good right now. The second is that the movie was the subject of an episode of Mystery Science Theater, but seeing as this video is basically just going to be me doing what they did, but... Worse, I feel like the less I know about that, the better. And yeah, other than that, there doesn't seem to be that much to say about the Screaming Skull. So let's just jump ahead to the part of the video where I do have stuff to say and start talking about the plot. Okay, so before I start talking about the plot, I just need to give you guys a little disclaimer up top and say that the version of the movie I'm going to be showing you has been colorized and... Whoever did the colorizing did not do a very good job at it. And I feel bad saying that because they definitely did a better job at colorizing it than I ever could, but that said, I kind of get the sense that their heart wasn't really in it. It seems like they just sort of put the colors where they thought they should be and hoped that the characters would happen to come into contact with them, but... Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. A lot of the time, things fall out of sync, and the people in the movie are left with these weird gray body parts that kind of make them look like they touched a magical artifact they weren't supposed to, and now they're being slowly drained of their essence. Still, that's hardly the biggest issue I have with this movie. I just knew that if I didn't address it now, y'all would probably be wondering about it. So, now that that's out of the way, let's begin, shall we? The movie opens at a poorly attended funeral where a disembodied voice is doing its best to set the scene. The Screaming Skull is a motion picture that reaches its climax in shocking horror. Its impact is so terrifying that it may have an unforeseen effect. It may kill you. Therefore, its producers feel they must assure free burial services to anyone who dies of fright while seeing the Screaming Skull. Twist! It was your funeral. I, I don't know what you did so that nobody attended it, but you're dead now, and I'm sorry that nobody loved you. And this right here is the gimmick I was talking about earlier. 
I guess there was another B-movie called Macabre that drummed up publicity by offering to sell people life insurance with every ticket that they bought, and the makers of Screaming Skull were trying to piggyback off the success of that by doing a much worse version of it. Like, I honestly don't even get how they were hoping this would sell more tickets, because, like, presumably, anybody seeing this has already bought a ticket to the movie, so, 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 so they don't really need to be convinced to see the movie. I mean, I guess maybe they were hoping that people who saw the movie would tell other people about the gimmick and create word of mouth, but... That doesn't really feel like a very sound plan to me because this is how I imagine that would actually play out. I saw this movie this weekend and they said it was so scary that if you died of fright while you were watching it, they would pay for your burial. Cool. Was it actually that scary? No. Also, I don't think I'd ever believe that a movie could be so scary that it would make me die of fright, but if there is one that could, it's definitely not the one that's offering to pay for my burial if I die of fright. I'm not what you would call an expert on business, but I do know that no big movie studio is ever going to knowingly put themselves at risk of losing money, so if they say that they'll pay for your burial if their film scares you to death, that means that their film is probably not going to scare you to death. It's just basic economics. And honestly, even if they did actually believe that their movie was truly scary, I feel like it would still be pretty obvious to anybody watching that this marketing ploy is not a sincere offer, because one need only to look at the film's special effects to realize that the people making it did not have money to be paying for people's burials. I don't know if Party City was around in 1958, but... If it was, I would assume that this movie's entire special effects budget was spent in the discount section of a party city in the first week of November when all of the Halloween stuff goes on sale. We get our first look at what this movie considers scary directly after that weird funeral with the movie's title sequence. And basically all it is is a shot of a koi pond filled with enough dry ice that any koi that were in there were definitely killed followed by a very fake looking skull floating up to the surface. And like, don't get me wrong, if I saw this at a friend's Halloween party, I'd be very impressed, but as the opening of a horror film, it feels a little bit lacking. I think that part of the problem is that this movie very much hinges on the audience thinking that the scariest thing in the entire world is a skeleton, and like, I don't. I mean, I guess if I saw one in person walking around like it was alive, I'd be frightened in an existential sort of way, but even then, I don't think I'd be threatened by it. Of all of the ghouls, the skeleton is by far the least menacing. You know, a Dracula has fangs, a witch has magic, a mummy has swarms of scarabs that follow their every command. Skeletons don't have shit though, I have everything that they have and then some. I'm basically a skeleton wearing a suit of armor made of meat. I very rarely feel confident in my ability to kick something's ass, but I do firmly believe that I would be able to take a skeleton, because like, it doesn't even have tendons to hold itself together. One whack from my trident, and it's gonna crumble into a pile of bones. I carry around a trident in this scenario. There are skeletons roaming the earth, so I figure I should probably have something to protect myself with. Anywho, after that title sequence, we get another longer title sequence before cutting to a happy young couple pulling up to a beautiful country manor. Yeah, at least I think they're young. I have trouble gauging the ages of anyone before the year 1998, so you could tell me they were anywhere between 18 and 74, and I'd probably believe you. Their voices certainly don't help matters, because it's very hard for me to comprehend that anyone who talks like this... Welcome, Mrs. Whitlock. It's lovely, Eric. You look disappointed for a moment. I did not. It's really lovely. ...was ever below retirement age. Still, even if they're not young, they definitely seem happy. They've just gotten married, and so they've moved out of the city in order to start a life together. 
And like this first part of the movie is just a lot of exposition about what that life entails. And it's all kind of boring. So I'm going to do my best to give you guys the TLDR version of it. But bear with me because it might take a second. Don't worry though. It will all make sense soon. I promise. Actually, no, I can't promise that. A lot of what I say doesn't make sense, so there's a chance that even after I explain things, they will still be confusing, but I'm going to do my best, so I don't know. Give me a shot, I guess. Basically, this house belongs to the main guy. He used to live there with his old wife, but then she slipped on a leaf in a rainstorm and cracked her head on the edge of a decorative pond. As one does. After she died, he abandoned the house and moved to the city where he met his next wife. And after marrying her, the two decide to move back because while it was apparently too weird for him to live in the house where his first wife died alone, living there with some new broad is just like totally cool. As is often the case with palatial estates where people's first wife died, the house is extremely secluded, and it's because of that that there are only three other characters in the entire movie. Uh, well, four, if you include skeletons. The most important of these is the gardener. Well, there's Mickey. Excuse me, honey. Mickey! Ah, poor Mickey. He keeps this place up like a shrine. Eric told me how he loved Marion. Mickey's father was a gardener here when Marion's mother was alive. Mickey and Marion grew up together here. Jenny, this is Mickey. How do you do, Mickey? I hope we'll be good friends. Well, Mickey. Okay, I'm not sure, but I think his name might be Mickey. I don't know, I'm terrible at remembering stuff like that, so... Whatever his name is, he is the gardener of the estate. As best as I can tell, this was the childhood home of the main dude's first wife, and Mickey's family has taken care of it for generations in a way that seems fairly antiquated, even for the standards of 1958. Like, I don't fully get what Mickey's employment situation is, but it seems like the sort of thing that stopped being legal with the signing of the Magna Carta. Uh, like, I honestly think that the best way to describe him might be a serf. His dad was the family's gardener when the first wife was a kid, and because of that, she and Mickey were childhood friends. And then when the dad retired and or died on the job, Mickey took over as groundskeeper. And, like, that alone wouldn't seem that weird to me, but... Things start to get a little bit hanky once the first wife dies and the husband abandons the house because after that, Mickey just like stays there and continues to garden. So like, I don't really know what that's about. It doesn't seem like Mickey is making any sort of salary and the best guess I have at how he's surviving is by eating whatever he can manage to grow on the estate, which like, Again, this is 1958. The main dude drives a car with Back to the Future doors. I feel like this sort of setup should not still be allowed, but everyone is just cool with it. To make matters worse, Mickey seems to have an intellectual disability, and as you can probably guess, that is not handled well in this movie from the 1950s. The way it's depicted is strange, because at first I didn't even get that that's what was going on, but once I noticed it, it started to feel very cartoonish and over the top, which... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they managed to toe that line. I think some of my confusion might have stemmed from the fact that a lot of his early dialogue is done in the form of monologues about his dead friend. You said, you said, Mickey, wait here. I'm going down to the house for just a minute. Wait here, Mickey, you said. And then you went away in the rain. And you didn't come back to play. Man, why did you, why did you 
<laughs> and watching that, he kind of just seems like a guy in grief to me. But I feel like someone in 1958 would watch that and think, well, things that are too horrible for me to say out loud. I get the sense that certain aspects of this film that people in the 1950s would have picked up on are lost on modern audiences, because the way the film presents Mickey leads me to believe that people in the 1950s would have seen a person with an intellectual disability and assumed that they were... well... evil? Maybe I'm wrong, but between the fact that he's constantly talking to a dead lady and the fact that he kind of just slinks around in the back of scenes sometimes, I get the sense that the audience is supposed to assume that Mickey is up to no good. That said though, Mickey also kind of just reads like a nice dude to me, so I feel like for this sort of fake out to really land, it means that he was being coded in a way that has thankfully been lost to time. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it, but whatever the case may be, one thing's for certain, and that's that Mickey has spectacular hair. Aside from Mickey, the other supporting characters in The Screaming Skull are a husband and wife duo whose names I don't remember because they never say them 18 times in the span of a single scene. They're the main dude's old friends, and when they heard that he was moving back to the house where his first wife died tragically, they decided to pop in and meet his new wife, with whom they quickly develop a friendship. Jenny, this is Mrs. Snow. I'm very happy to meet you. Jenny, this is a lovely surprise. And the Reverend Mr. Snow. Hello, my dear. You see, sparks are flying. Seriously, though, it might not seem like it from that clip, but the main woman and this couple become good friends very quickly. After their introduction, Jenny invites them to stay for dinner, and by the time the two of them are headed home for the night, they're already saying shit like this. Eric, thank you very much for bringing Jenny into our lives. And like, I get that people just naturally don't like me, but if anyone said something like that about me, I would be very taken aback. It feels very forward for someone you've only known for two hours. I do think that there's a reason that things move so quickly though, and that's because these two will eventually serve as Jenny's saviors. The movie is working overtime to let us know that she has someone on her side, because if she didn't, then she'd have to save herself, which would require her to have agency, which is impossible because she's a woman. Saviors or not though, they still do what you're supposed to do when you meet a friend's significant other, and gossip about her the moment they leave her home. Good night. Good night. Good night. Edward, did you know that Jenny's very wealthy? Yes, Mr. Ma told me in town today. Well, she's not at all like Marion. You know, she's so gentle and timid as if... as if she were afraid of something. Hmm. I wonder if the fact that the new wife of a man whose first wife died in a mysterious tragedy is rich is going to come up again in this horror movie. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Cough. After their dinner, the two do as is customary for a newlywed couple and fall asleep in separate rooms. How are the cots? Fine. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about the fact that they don't share a bed because I get that rules for movies were different back then, but if she does have to sleep in her own bed, does it really have to be a twin-sized cot? This movie is full of murder and ghosts and more casual ableism than I can shake a stick at, but by far the most disturbing part to me is watching that grown woman try to cram herself into that tiny little bed that I can tell just by looking at it is lumpy as fuck. Later that night, she's awakened by a loud thumping noise, so she wanders around her big empty house alone to investigate. Eventually, she makes her way to a weird empty side room where she finds an open window blowing in the wind, along with something a little spookier she wasn't expecting. I'm not gonna mince 
words here. That is a terrible painting. And it's weird, too, because I feel like it probably didn't need to be as bad as it is. Like, it kind of gives off vibes of when movies need to make a statue of a main character, but for budget reasons, they obviously can't commission an actual bronze statue of them, so they make it out of plastic or something, and it ends up looking really fake, but... This painting isn't actually of anyone in particular, so I don't really know why it looks like that. It's supposed to be a portrait that the main dude's first wife painted, but we never actually see the main dude's first wife outside of this portrait, so in theory, they could have used literally any painting of a woman in the world, and the fact that they settled on this one added a fun little layer to this movie that made me giggle every time I saw it. When the woman sees the painting, she starts screaming, because... Well, obviously she does, I would too, and so her husband comes in to console her in the most 1950s way imaginable. That bad feeling's come back. I've forbidden you to talk about it. She looked like that, Eric. My mother looked like that. Oh, Jenny, Jenny. I can't help it, Eric. Darling, you're just talking yourself into those same old fears. I've got to talk about it, Eric. I have to talk about I it. I forbid you to talk about it now. Healthy. Hearing that dude forbid his wife from talking about her emotions was one of many times during this movie that I felt very happy to have not lived through the 1950s because it is insane to me that there was ever a time when that shit flew. Like for one thing, I'm not a relationship expert by any means, but one tip I will give to anyone watching this is that if you are in a relationship, then the word forbid just shouldn't be in your vocabulary. No good can come from it, and if you ever find yourself saying it, then you are probably in the wrong. And what makes this all the more insane is that this is the guy's attempt at consoling her. He literally just heard his wife screaming at the top of her lungs, and his response to that was to be like, Hey, 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 honey. Keep it to yourself. I don't feel like hearing about it. In front of the painting, they find a lily pad from the pond where the first wife drowned, leading the husband to blame Mickey for everything that just went down because... Well, he kind of just blames Mickey for everything. Mickey caused this. You may as well know. He does look for Marion night after night down by that pond. And he probably comes here afterwards. I'm going to speak to Mickey in the morning. Now, don't you see? Simply, it's all explained away. Jenny's not convinced, though. She claims she heard the sound of screaming, and she believes that this whole episode is a sign that she's starting to go insane, which admittedly seems like a pretty big leap, but as it turns out, she was committed to a sanitarium once, and her previous mental health crisis began with her hearing noises that weren't there. She starts suggesting that maybe she needs to go back to the institution, and Ever the supportive husband, the main dude does everything he can to dissuade her from getting the help she needs by trying to explain away the screams. But if I also heard a scream, Eric, before when I went to the hospital, I was hearing things. I'm hearing them again. What did you hear? It was a high, strange scream. High, strange scream. Like a peacock's cry? What's that sound like? Come here. I feel like there is probably a better way you could have made that point. Uh, I'm honestly surprised that didn't kill the peacock. Whatever though, it works. Jenny accepts her husband's explanation and manages to calm down enough to fall asleep in that horrid little bed of hers. The next morning, the husband heads into town to run some errands because, well, apparently the morning after your wife is frightened so badly that she's left questioning her own sanity, is the right time to do that. I've got to see about the lights, the phone, the bank, and the warehouse people about that furniture. You know, that cot's just about broken my back. See, I was right about that damn cot. Lumpy as fuck. Also, I don't mean to sound crass here, but that lady has the pointiest boobs that I have ever seen in my life. 
It is endlessly fascinating to me watching these old movies and seeing how boob preferences change from decade to decade. Still, pointy or not, Jenny's tits were calmed by her husband's explanation that Mickey broke into the house the night before in order to mourn his dead friend. And so being the kind woman that she is, she decides to reach out to the grieving gardener. Oh, look out. You almost cut him. It's a handsome one, isn't he? So cuddly and warm. When I was a little girl, I used to want to be a caterpillar. So I was a very little girl. Okay, I get that she's trying to be nice, but... That was some of the worst small talk I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I feel like when you're trying to connect with someone, you should build up a little bit before telling them what kind of insects you wanted to be as a child. Also, what the hell is she talking about? That is a terrible caterpillar. I have seen many handsome caterpillars in my life, and that thing is not one of them. Honestly, if she didn't specify what it was, I would have assumed that she had just plucked a little turd off of that bush. Still, she's trying her best, and in an effort to get through to Mickey, she suggests that the two of them bring some flowers to the first wife's grave, which he happily agrees to. And seeing the first wife's grave is weird, because it's another example of that thing I was talking about with the painting, where they clearly couldn't afford to make it look realistic. But it's double strange this time around, because not only is it crummy looking, but it also looks nothing like the painting. You'd think that if they were gonna have such phony looking props, they'd at least have some consistency. Like, I'm the first to admit that I'm not great with faces, but this is very clearly not the same woman. Together, they put lilies on the first wife's grave, and after sharing a moment, Mickey finally feels comfortable enough to open up to Jenny. Uh, unfortunately, though, what he says is not really the sort of thing you want to hear from a new friend. She cries. She cries? In the night. Dead people don't cry, Mickey. I heard her. Mickey? I will be perfectly honest, I don't fully get why Mickey ran away there. Other than the fact that the guy playing him also directed this movie and he clearly wants every opportunity he can to show off the fact that the character he's playing walks with a limp. In the context of the movie, though, it makes no sense, because I feel like the implication here is that the first wife says something to Mickey that frightens him off. But the whole point of the scene is that Mickey is telling Jenny that he hears the same voices that she does. So for him to then hear a voice that she doesn't hear, it very much undercuts that revelation. I'm not entirely sure if that sentence I just said makes sense, but my point is this movie is stupid. Jenny must not follow the same logic that I do, though, because she seems to believe what Mickey's telling her, and because of that, when she goes to bed that night, she's a bit shaken up. I don't think he quite expects she's gone. She cries. She cries in the night. I think he expects her to show up one of these mornings. She died in the water. The base of her skull was smashed. She didn't want to die. She died in the water. Okay, Jenny, calm down. As far as nightmares go, those are not that bad. About once a month, I dream that the world is ending in some horrible way, and Every fiber of my being believes that I and everyone I love is about to die, and I don't thrash around my bed like I'm being possessed by a demon. 
I would gladly take some wavy blue heads repeating things I heard earlier that day, any day of the week. Although I guess in Jenny's defense, her tossing and turning probably has more to do with the fact that she's currently living through a waking nightmare because at this point, she's either going mad or being haunted by a terrible painter. So. She's woken from whatever that was by another peacock scream because, well, the peacocks in this movie are always screaming. Pro pro probably because their owners are the sort of people who pelt them with ashtrays. She gets up to check on the noise and for some reason ends up back in that room with the spooky painting where she's met with another terrifying surprise. a skeleton. In what might be the most confusing decision of the entire film, Jenny runs back to her bedroom, sits on her bed long enough that she can catch her breath, and then returns to the painting room where she picks up the skull and tosses it out the window. And like granted, I've never suffered from delusions. But I feel like if I were questioning what around me was real to the point that I was considering committing myself, I would probably hang on to every piece of evidence I could get my hands on. The first thing people are going to ask her when she tells them she found a skull is, where is it? And then she's going to have to be like, oh, yeah, about that. I decided it was in my best interest to chuck it onto the lawn, which... I gotta say, not really helping her sanity defense. Especially because it's not like she did it as a reflex. She literally left the room, collected her thoughts, and came back. And she was still like, yeah, I should probably do this. Also, not for nothing, but even if it wasn't the only way to prove her own sanity, it's still a skull. Have some respect for the dead, lady. I'm not saying you have to take it out to dinner or anything like that, but... Don't just huck it onto the lawn where a bunch of angry peafowl can get at it. And maybe if Jenny had thought things through a little better, then she would have been spared from what happens next, because even though the skull's out of the house, her ordeal isn't over. She hears a loud rapping at the front door and makes her way down the stairs to investigate. Oh my god, this is taking forever. Okay, I admit that I've never opened up a haunted door before, but I feel like it should be like ripping off a band-aid. Pro prolonging it just makes things worse. Eventually, she makes it to the first floor and opens the door, and you guys will never guess what's on the other side. I'm just kidding, it's the skull. This movie's not really full of many surprises. Jenny doesn't seem to have been expecting it though because she stumbles back in fear and as she does, she's followed by the skull which rolls behind her like a bowling ball. 
And watching that was very funny to me, because I had kind of assumed that since it's a magical haunted skull, it moved around by flying or teleportation or something like that, but apparently it very much obeys the laws of physics. Based on the way it rolls around, I kind of have to assume that earlier, when it was knocking, it was literally just flinging itself against the door, and the mental image of that made this skeleton even less scary to me than it already was, which is very not scary because, like I said earlier, fuck skeletons. Jenny clearly feels differently about skeletons than I do, though, because she passes out in fear, and the next morning, the main dude finds her and slaps her awake like the loving husband that he is. Jenny. 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 Honey. Honey. It's all right, darling. It's all right. I'm right here. I'm right here. Just lie back. That's right. Just lie back. Why did he wake her up if he was just going to tell her to lie down? Jenny asks her husband if he saw a skull when he found her, and when he says no, she does the rational thing and assumes that she's in the midst of a psychotic episode. Given her history of mental illness, Jenny decides that she should probably seek treatment, but her husband has different plans for her. Eric? I want you to call Dr. Ann tomorrow in New York. I want you to take me back. No, Jenny. Now, it may sound selfish, but don't you see having you to love? I'm happy, too. I don't want to lose that. Okie dokie. Even though all signs are pointing to Jenny having a mental breakdown right now, the thought of not having her around would be more than the husband could bear. So she's instead forced to just kind of deal with it and hope that she gets better. And before you go getting too mad at the husband, just know that it's not like he does nothing. He, he does physically assault Mickey. So. Jenny tells him about what Mickey said to her at the first wife's grave, and he is not happy about it. Mickey says Marion cries at night. Why, that childish stupid... Thinking that Mickey is responsible for the skull, the next time the husband sees him, he chases him down and roughs him up a bit. And remember before when I said that the guy playing Mickey was clearly looking for any opportunity to show off his character's limp? Mickey! Mickey! Believe it or not, that is only the second worst chase scene in this movie. When beating up his employee fails to cure his wife's mental illness, the main dude decides to resort to more drastic measures because he's willing to do whatever he can to help her, short of actually getting her help. Jenny, I'm going to do something, and you're going to help me do it. What's that? That portrait upstairs. It reminds you of your mother. Yes. You were fine until you saw it. Now it has you all preoccupied with memories of the past. We're gonna burn it. And this just goes to show you how naive people in 1958 were, because obviously when a creepy painting is ruining your life, you don't set fire to it. All that's going to do is release the evil that dwells within. They didn't know any better, though. It was a simpler time. And because of that, they set that bad girl ablaze. Go on, Jenny. <laughs> uh, it's even sillier on fire. 
When the picture is fully destroyed, the couple pours water over its remains. And you guys will never guess what Jenny finds when she's sifting through the ashes. Ah! I'm just kidding, it's the skull. It, it, it's always going to be the skull. When Jenny sees it, she passes out again, because apparently women in the 1950s react to danger in the same way as an opossum. What is it, darling? It's a skull! It's a skull! Darling, there's no skull there. There's no skull there, darling. There is no skull there, Jenny. Darling, there's no skull there. There's no skull. Spoilers! There was a skull there. As it turns out, Jenny hasn't been going mad at all. As was often the case with couples in the 1950s, the woman's mental breakdown was the result of repeated gaslighting from her husband. At least I think he was gaslighting her. It's kind of hard to tell what the husband knew and when, but when that skull magically appears in the ashes of his dead wife's portrait, he does not seem particularly surprised by it. So I kind of suspect that he's known about it for a while now. As I alluded to earlier, this entire marriage was just an elaborate plan to kill Jenny and take her money. And so to make sure that that plan doesn't fall apart, he hides the skull from his wife before she can wake up. And like, granted, I've only covered up a couple of murders in my life, so I'm hardly an expert here, but I feel like he probably could have tried a little bit harder because the pond where his first wife died and where the only other person living on his property comes every night to mourn feels like a bad hiding spot. And it becomes an even worse hiding spot when we learn that while the main dude is hiding the skull, Mickey is just like hanging out in some nearby bushes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what he's doing back there, but he's in the right place at the right time. He scoops up the skull and brings it back to the greenhouse where he seems to live for some reason, and this is where the serious shit starts to go down. After what happened earlier, the husband is left with two choices. Either admit that the skull exists, or allow Jenny to continue thinking she's losing her mind and take her back to the mental institution. And so obviously, he chooses the latter. B because he's a dick. On the night before she's set to ship out, she heads down to the greenhouse to say goodbye to Mickey because, again, Mickey inexplicably lives in a greenhouse and you guys will never guess what she finds down there. Mickey? Eric and I are leaving, Mickey. I'd like to say goodbye. I'd like to leave as your friend, Mickey. Mickey? Hey, at least it's not a skull this time. Jenny screams and runs away because, well, aside from fainting, that's pretty much all that her character does. And she's followed by the ghost. And Remember earlier when I said that that was only the second worst chase scene in the movie? she's running so fast that ghost is clearly not trying to break a sweat 
Jenny makes it home, but before she can breathe a sigh of relief, her husband pops out and makes it so that she can't breathe at all. Uh, he chokes her. I, I don't know why I put it that way. It actually feels very inappropriate, g given what plays out. <laughs> And I would say that that right there is the closest this movie ever gets to a genuine scare. It's surprising and visceral in a way that only old horror movies can be. But pro probably because the lax workplace standards of the day mean that there was a good chance he was actually choking her. Unfortunately though, for as good of a scare as that was, it is very much undercut by what comes next. Jenny passes out, as she's wont to do, and when she does, the husband hears a knocking at the front door, and you guys will never guess what's on the other side. Okay, I know I said earlier that a skeleton was the least menacing of all the ghouls, but that was before I saw a skeleton in a sundress. And like, I don't fully get why it's a skeleton, because it's supposed to be the ghost of the first wife, and like, not to get scientific here, but ghosts aren't skeletons. Unless I'm wrong, and it is supposed to be the physical skeleton of the first wife, although... If that's the case, then it implies that at some point after reanimating herself, she found a box of her old clothes and got dressed for a day at the park, which... Well, if that's the case, then I'm very upset that they didn't include that scene. I don't know, whatever's going on, I love every second of it. It's silly to look at, and it's even sillier in motion. In case it wasn't clear, the twist of this movie is that the ghost of the first wife wasn't haunting Jenny at all. She was just trying to warn her about what a beehole her husband is, and now she's back from the grave to get her revenge. She chases the main dude around, and though he does manage to put up a pretty good fight, she eventually chases him out of the house and down to the pond where he drowns, so... Yeah, he's dead now. End of film. Eh. Meh. Honestly, my major takeaway from watching The Screaming Skull is that I think maybe we're a little bit too hard on baby boomers. I super wasn't expecting that to be my takeaway from this horror movie about a skeleton in a dress, but... Here we are. And before I go on, I feel like I need to pre-defend myself a little bit because I'm pretty sure I just said the most controversial thing I've ever said on this channel. Which is honestly saying something because I once spent a whole video sympathizing with a terrorist. So. But I truly do think that defending boomers might be a harder sell on here. For whatever reason, the internet has decided that generations are a thing and they're all at war with one another, and of all of the generations, boomers seem to be the worst. You don't have to look very hard to find people who think that the fact that someone happened to be born before 1970 makes them an inherently bad person, which is very weird in a way that I don't fully know how to put into words. Like, in no way is generational hate like racism, but... It does sometimes feel like the people who are really into it wish that they could be racist. Like they have the racism muscle in their body and 
they need to exercise it somehow, but they know that racism is bad, so they've found another outlet for their vitriol and gross generalizations. Like, like, like it's kind of like how the vampires in Twilight drink deer blood, if that makes sense. And like, I get it. I'm not going to sit here and say that boomers are good because, well, for one thing, they probably wouldn't get as much hate as they do if they never decided that being a millennial meant a person who has gay sex with an avocado while they complain. So they kind of have themselves to blame. Also, boomers are responsible for a lot of the bad shit that plagues all our lives today, you know? Ronald Reagan. That's honestly the only thing I can think of off the top of my head, but that's really all I need. He basically destroyed the world. And the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of terrible boomers. Click on any random comment on your aunt's Facebook page, and it'll be nothing but sexism, and memes where minions wear Blue Lives Matter t-shirts. Still, for as many bad baby boomers as there are out there, I feel like there are also a lot of really good ones. My mom, for example, never voted for Ronald Reagan, and she'd kill you dead if you said that she did. And after watching The Screaming Skull, I feel like my view on all boomers has shifted just a little bit, because not only do I kinda understand the bad ones a little bit better, but I am way more impressed by how good the good ones managed to be. Because while I didn't find this movie particularly good or scary, I did find it interesting just for the mere fact that it provided me with a little window into the world that baby boomers were born into. And after peering into that window for an hour and change, I can say pretty confidently that that world was fucked. Honestly, the scariest stuff in this movie was the stuff that felt eerily normal, you know, like the dismissive way that they treated Mickey, and the messed up dynamic in the main couple's marriage. I mean, hell, even the fact that they slept in separate beds was kind of creepy in its own weird way. But that was also just the world back then. I mean, not literally, because I'm pretty sure in real life, married couples slept in the same bed, but things were still so repressed and weird that they didn't think it was okay to show married couples sleeping in the same bed in movies, and that's kind of messed up. And if that's the world you were born into, then I get how you can look at the world of today, where smutty married couples in movies share the same bed with reckless abandon and have trouble adjusting. The fact of the matter is that things are different now than they used to be. We like to think of the past as being dead and gone, but the truth is that its ghost still haunts us and affects our lives in tangible ways. And you honestly don't even need to go back as far as the time of this movie in order to find its impact. In 2021, I made a video where I arbitrarily settled on a random format. And when I started writing this script, I spent a solid couple of hours trying to make that format fit, even though there was absolutely no reason to do it beyond the fact that that's how I've done it in the past. And a couple of weeks ago, I got a copyright claim, and because of that, I spent way too many hours making a video about an old movie nobody cares about, just because I'm still gun-shy that it'll happen again. You can find the past's bony little fingerprints everywhere you look, and that's honestly terrifying sometimes, because, like, you can't really change the past. And when you think about things like that, it can be easy to feel like the best thing to do is to ignore it, or run from it, or chuck it out the window in hopes that it stops bothering you. But really, I think the opposite might be true. Though the thought of it might make you want to scream and faint, I think the best thing we can do sometimes is stare the past right in its big ugly skull. Because the more I think about it, the more I think that the past is a lot like a skeleton in a sundress, you know? Once you actually get a good look at it, you realize that it's not really as scary as you thought it would be. It may seem like it's haunting you, but really it's more of a warning. And if you actually stop to listen to what it has to say, the past can actually go a long way in making your present a little bit better. After all, if things in the past hadn't played out how they did, The Screaming Skull probably wouldn't have been my first choice of movies to talk about. But now that I've done it, I'm kind of happy that I did. But yeah, that's my video. Please like and subscribe and share and... I don't know, whatever I'm supposed to say here. Also, if you have the money for it and 
you want to do it, then please consider subscribing to my Patreon. There's not a lot it offers beyond the joy of helping me out, but if you like these videos, it's the best way to make sure that they keep happening. So, or if you want to do a more one-time thing, then you can also just give me money through YouTube now, apparently. Uh, it's called Super Thanks. And um, I've gotten a few of them, and I really appreciate them. They also really help the channel, and I've never thanked those who, who did it. So I'm going to do that now. Um, thank you to Kat Hollis, Alan Morgan, David Anderson, Crispy Dorado, and Angel Barrera. You are um, very appreciated. But also, if you don't want to give me money, I understand. I probably wouldn't if I were in your shoes, but I appreciate you just watching it. This supports the channel too, so everyone just keep doing what they're doing, and my battery is about to die, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end things here. Just kidding. Uh, welcome back, real fans. Uh, I wasn't kidding about the fact that my battery is about to die, but I am kidding that the video is over because it's time for everyone's favorite part of the video. Willie posing for th the patrons' names, blah blah blah. I still haven't come up with a name for it. Probably never will. So uh, for this video, um, I want not video for this thumbnail. I kind of just want to recreate the poster for the screaming skull because it's a cool poster. So I will be playing the role of Jenny being haunted by the skull, so I feel like I'm not going to wear a negligee, but um, I'm just kind of going to look back and be like, ah. 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 and I'm just going to do this while the patron's name scroll, and if it just cuts out randomly, that's because my battery died. So hopefully I can get everyone's name in, um, but... Hopefully it doesn't if the if it if it ends when the battery stops recording it still saves the file. We'll find out. I even have like a bony thing on my shoulder, so like Oh no. Oh, screaming skull! <gasps> I'm running away from a skeleton. Ah! <gasps> How's she doing it? She's like touching her. I don't want to show. What's her face like? It's like looking up. I kind of want to make it obvious that I'm doing the poster on the thumbnail. I don't know. This section feels a little bit more rushed than normal. I don't know how that's possible, but it's because I'm, my camera's about to die. So. <gasps> what direction is she? She she's <gasps> Wait, but I don't know left and right good. I can't like picture what I don't know. Oh. <gasps> 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 
I always put my fans to my head. Damn, I'm not gonna lie, my battery goes on for a lot longer than I expected once it starts blinking. Um. <gasps> Scared Willy is definitely the homeliest of all Willies, so um, I'm not I'm not excited to look back at what I just.